Hello, works. Okay. So, hello, good afternoon, everybody. So, I think that we have a full session, which is very good, also for the speakers too. So, I suppose that many people is waiting for uh, the explanations and the presentations that you will have. So, the session today it's called IoT and Data Enabling and Next Generation of Urban Services. So, here I have to tell you that we have an excellent panel of people that I will just briefly introduce them to you. So we have David Graham, which is Deputy Chief Operating Officer from the City of San Diego. We have Trudy Norris Gray, Managing Director from Microsoft City Next. Then we have um, Jose Luis Mate, CTO of Public IT Services from NEC. Then we have Loic Baer, CEO of Opinum, Belgium. And we have Nicola Villa, which is Senior President, Government and Development from Mastercard. Okay. So one of the things that, that we expect to cover on the talk today is, as you must know, that IoT is entering a new stage. So we have many new technologies distributed along the city, which is also giving us the chance to gather much more data. So one of the questions that we have nowadays is, what's the impact it has somehow with the city structures itself? So understanding also on what's the value that we are bringing with all this data, with all these new technologies that we can deploy across the city to the citizen itself and also to the economy at some point. And also one of the things that also is being discussed and we will also have, we will also listen to some positions is the fact that we know that there are many pilots, but what should we do in order maybe to take into consideration what a large scale deployment should be on the cities? What are the implications they have? And in the end, the idea is that, that we have to, to change a bit of the paradigm and understanding that the fact that having all the giving the chance to the municipalists to manage all these new sensors technologies they have with the data they generate is that they should try to offer competitive services, which means this whole cities can innovate, delivering a new set of services, which in the end, they are empowering the users also and somehow are creating a, what we call a more efficient citizen-centric model. So this is, these are some of the topics that we will be discussing today here also, and the way that it's key on how we engage citizens. So it's very clear that if we are not able to engage the citizens itself, it's very difficult for the, for the cities also to deploy those technology. So they, they don't have to see the technology as a barrier. They have to, to integrate the technology on the daily life to be sure that it brings benefit for them as citizens to the city itself and that they can use the information that this technology is bringing. So in the end, one of the questions that we are also trying to solve is how to handle the process from the data cows to insights. Because believe me, it's huge, the data we have. And also in the end is how I, IoT is key for the city digital, digitalization. So these are the, somehow the brief discussions we'll have today. So I will start giving the floor to David Graham, which is Deputy Chief Operating Officer of San Diego. Thank you. All right. David. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, such a packed room. This is a fantastic topic, and I'm excited to get to share some of the San Diego story. Um, being from the United States, land of the free, home of the hyperbole, um, it seems like right now our politics are dominated by extreme rhetoric. So I will play along in setting the stage for why IoT means so much and what the San Diego story is by saying that the issues that are facing metros today um, are on par with nothing seen since the dinosaurs were wiped off the face of the earth. All right, people, we can have some fun here, we can relax, we can shake it out, right? Um, it is, is really, what is facing us today is of cataclysmic proportions, and either we're gonna do things like we always have, or we're gonna be agile, and we're going to adapt to the new situation that we face today. Because ultimately we're finding that things that are of a global scale, national scale, are coming to roost at City Hall, on our companies, on our businesses, on our communities, and really, metros are the ones that are moving forward in this space. So take San Diego, nice little spot there on the West Coast. Um, I know people think this is what my life is like, beaches, bays, sunshine, uh, babes in that particular case. Um, but uh, actually, San Diego is the birthplace of California. Um, the first settlers, the pioneers, the push in what was West Coast living started in San Diego. 
So that same sort of idea um, is something that we're continuing to push today in that pioneering sense. Now, cone of silence, I work for government, I'd like to keep my job. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of our dirty laundry because if we don't know what we've done and the negative side of things, then how can we really look towards a positive future? So um, around the turn of the century, Y2K, anybody remember the whole Y2K thing? Like, the world was supposed to end, planes were supposed to fall out of the sky because somebody didn't get a right date right in a computer program. Okay, that didn't happen. The world did not come to an end in 2000, except for in San Diego, we went broke. Some bad politicians, some bad pension deals, a couple folks got arrested, um, we lost our bond rating. I should not tell you this part of the story, but actually this is where it begins for San Diego. Now, I was not working for the city at the time, so of course I can talk about the bad decisions that were made um, that really laid out where we're going from here. So, um, when I, uh, the, the, the turnaround for the city really had to do with this particular mayor, um, former chief of police, pension reform occurred, we began moving up, things were getting great in San Diego, we we're coming out of the Great Recession, and then the voters picked this joker, who looks like the joker, <laughs> who promptly landed in a scandal um, in City Hall and on late night TV with John Oliver. Uh, I was not working for this guy either, so we're still good there. But this is actually where a lot of our story comes from, and I like to talk about this idea that you know the politics do matter. We try to embed these things in our organizations in a technological platform, but you can't forget about the leadership at the top. Fortunately, I work for this guy who just, he's got that mayor look to him, right? Um, who boldly uh, challenged us to go where no city, uh, no Star Trek joke, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't make fun of a guy that's willing to dress up like that, right? But he really did lay out an innovation agenda for San Diego, particularly as it related to sustainability and to climate. So, um, we're smart, but that's my city hall, all right? So as innovative as we're thinking about, as transformative as San Diego is being with the digitization of our services, this is what I expect to happen any day in my building, right? <laughs> it, it is just old, it is decrepit. Um, why? Because we have these legacy assets, right, that were not invested in during the worst times in San Diego's history. So, um, I like to think about the four big things that are facing us today as metropolitan areas. I call them the four horsemen of the metro apocalypse. Because if you can work apocalypse into your presentation, People have to get off their phones and actually pay attention to what I'm talking about. Um, rapid urbanization, aging infrastructure, climate change, cybersecurity. These are the things facing us, you know, dragons. All right, maybe not dragons, but if you think about what is facing your metro area today, it is on par with nothing that we have ever seen before. And who's being asked to deal with these four horsemen of the apocalypse? Not the national government, not your state government, cities are being asked and citizens are demanding that we do that. So how do we do this? Well, resources are always gonna be stretched, right? Stretched to the breaking point. There's not money just flowing around to solve these issues, so how do we do more with less? I think about this as what the future was going to be, right? The fantastical future that we were all going to eventually see. Um, these ideas about things around the, the Sunray sedan, you know, bottled sunlight that is driving and powering your car doesn't exist, not happening, except for our demonstration project using EV charging directly from the sun, bottled and put into your electric vehicle. Um, I like to think about this because it's totally changing the nature of transportation and the infrastructure that we need to build associated with that. Um, and, and how do we take this a step further? Using parking meter revenue to support EV shuttles like this. The big question around IoT then is how do you integrate all of this with the information that's coming from your mobile phone, your mobile device. And yes, I did get the mayor to ride in one of those too. <laughs> so this is, I think, one of the perfect examples for us around streetlights, right? The idea of a legacy asset that was extremely inefficient, we didn't know how much energy it was using. Um, we decided to take this and say, how can we turn it into a platform? Wirelessly connected with enhanced sensors. We're deploying 14,000 of these streetlights with 3,200 of them having um, enhanced sensors. Why? Because essentially you take that streetlight and instead of providing illumination, you're being illuminated from that asset. So things like transportation and parking information and data, right? So in addition to all the mobility data you can get from mobile phones, this has the ability to change the way that we plan our transportation system. Or vision zero goals around zero pedestrian deaths 
um, and trying to make safer intersections. We don't have a good way of counting people walking or biking, even though we have huge goals to move in that space, the streetlights can do that. And parking availability, simply being able to provide information to people using that streetlight that's saving us $3 million a year uh, with a 60% reduction in energy that also is laying out the vision for how we create this platform for delivery of services. It also is connecting us, obviously, to the app economy. We work a lot with our developer community, coming up with simple ideas like if you have transport data and you have parking data, create a food truck app, right, where people could know where they could go to, um, to have the most successful food truck. I like to think about this not just with engaging the technologists and the developers, but actually the community. We held a block party for streetlights. Now, we had 300 people show up. I know all of you would have shown up. I was skeptical as to how many people would show up to talk about streetlights. This engagement at this level is really what is driving people's interest in this IoT platform and actually helping to deliver and demand the services that we want to see in our cities. So I think that from a San Diego perspective, it's about a platform of technology, but it's also a platform of people that are directly engaged in one thing. I don't like to think about what the newest, coolest, most interesting technology is. I apologize to the vendors in the room. I think about one thing, people. If we forget about the people, then we've already taken the biggest misstep in becoming a smart city and a smart community. It's ultimately about driving those outcomes for the services and the people that we serve today. That, I think, is what is the hallmark of smart. That is what IoT can provide. And that is what will really be transformational in this digital revolution that many of the metros are dealing with today and that is subject to our conversation. Okay. So, appreciate okay. the time. Thank you very much, David. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So, our next speaker is Rudy Norris Gray, Managing Director from Microsoft. City next, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Serge, Sergi, there. I just want to make sure this is, this is working. Let me be provocative. I think IoT is bringing a new order, not just, just to our cities, but to our world. And my question for you today is, are you ready for it? Are you ready to harness the power that IoTs can give you if you take that data and put, turn it into insight? Let me give you a bit of a taste of it. I come, I live in Seattle. It's a real spooky sight to go down the freeway in Seattle where Tesla are test driving their assisted driving. It's really weird when somebody's driving their car and tapping away on their mobile phone. No hands, no feet. And yet, the car elegantly deals with the crazy driving that's there. Let me give you another insight, and that's a personal one. Uh, just last week, I was in Seattle. The weather's turned cold. And I was freezing in my home. We've got a new smart energy system in our home. Uh, and it runs on my husband's mobile phone. My husband had take, taken a journey to the UK. The computer had decided that the owner of the smart device was in the UK, so it decided to turn my heating off. You know, are we ready for this? And last week, I happened to bump into uh, somebody on, uh, on an aeroplane. And he was from the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK. And he was telling me about the Civil Aviation Authorities from around the world coming together in Montreal last week to talk about how they're going to carve up airspace around us for the millions and millions of flying robots. They, I thought they were called drones. They're going to be called flying robots. that are not just to, going to take me from A to B or you from A to B, but actually to, to ferry the cargo that we are buying online more and more and more. Are you ready for it? Because it's happening. If the Civil Aviation Authority is carving up this airspace, are you ready for dodging them? I don't see this as a challenge. I see this as an opportunity. IoT is already everywhere. You know it. You just may not realize it. We're comfortable with the automatic pilot 
in an aircraft. When will we all become comfortable with the IoT that's already around us and that is yet to come? Our journey times in cars and buses and trains are much better as a result of sensor technology sending data. Pipes, electricity, sewage, flood mechanisms, they're sending data back to keep us safe and secure in the services that we provide. I was talking to somebody recently who talked about the fertility of soil as a result of the sensor in the soil. And also about the fertility of animals. Sensors are now in animals, really helping us to feed the world as the world's population is increasing and our demands on our planet is increasing. For me, this is not about data, this is about insight and our passion, our ingenuity in terms of grabbing that data and really turning it into insight so it can be better for all. I've got lots of examples in terms of, of where IoT is making a change for the better. I've given you a few already. I've picked Auckland here because it's, it's probably like a city near you. It had problems with its public funds, never enough. It was finding that people wanted to use their cars better than, more than their transit systems, their public transit systems. But you know, once they put the sensors in, once they grabbed data, what happened? People started using public services more, taking cars off the road, journey times got better, parking got easier, and more effective use of public funds. I could talk about London Underground. Many of you will have used the tube, as, as we call it. But it's, a real, it's got a real capacity problem. It's been around for more than 100 years with little extension. It has to squeeze every last use out of it. So when predictive analytics came, in tandem with the sensor technology, it was, a, it was not only uh, used to reduce cost, it was used to increase capacity, keep more tubes on the, the, the line. So it's already around us. My question to you again, if I may, is how are you going to use it? Are you frightened of it? Are you fearful? I certainly was. I thought IoT was something for the next generations. I realize it's already around me and it's improving the way I live. I think you would agree. The question is, how are you going to connect your things? There's lots of data in there. How are you going to turn it into insights by using smart analytics so you can visualize it, see trends, model? And then are you ready to act? You may expect that I would talk about technology coming from the company that I come from. I think technology is the easy bit. Actually, David alighted on, on this. I think it's the policy that really matters. Our job, collectively, is to work with all stakeholders, the citizen especially, is to create a trust around the data that's captured, how it's stored, how it's used. This is where we have to put a huge amount of, of energy. We've got to worry about privacy. We've got to worry about balancing human rights and public safety. Whose data is it anyway? I believe whatever data you put into the system is your data. That's certainly our policy. We need to be transparent and build trust in this new utility that's powered by IoT, data and insights. So for me, my challenge, let's grab hold of this opportunity. There's a new world order. Your city can benefit from it. Your borough, your county, your community. 
What outcome would you like from it? Where is your pain point? Where's your opportunity? How will you differentiate your city, your village, your environs against everybody else? Absolutely, True, choose a platform that you can trust, technically and also from a policy point of view. And put the required policies in place to make sure that people truly trust what they have in front of them. I can see the next one. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you very much. Really. Okay, thank you. Great speech. So let me introduce the next speaker, which is Nicola Villa, which is Senior Vice President, Government and Development from MasterCard. Go ahead. Thank you. The thank floor you. is yours. And good afternoon, uh, everybody. Let me see. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm actually new to MasterCard. I'm two months into the company. I spent the last 22 years working for other IT companies which are present over here. And what I've learned from MasterCard in my, in my discussion and in my early uh, days is uh, we are a payment technology company who is uh, fighting against a very fierce competitor. And that competitor is cash. 85% of the transactions around the world are made in cash. Cash is uh, costly, always unsecure, and is basically the foundation of the shadow economy. So in our uh, quest to basically shift the transactions from uh, cash into digital, we work, of course, in the city space. And cities are responsible for 80% of the world GDP. Right? So that's an area in which we find uh, very interesting solutions. When you look at what we do in the cities, we've been working uh, for many years in the city space. We have today about 100 partnerships with city governments around the world. And we tend to act into three areas. Traditionally, we've been focusing on uh, digital payments, collections, and disbursements. In places like South Africa, we have 20 million people today receiving their benefits of all kinds through prepaid cards instead of doing this through cash. So their uh, likelihood to spend the money throughout the month versus spending all the first week is much higher. And together with this type of program, we're, for example, providing training to those families and those people who will not be bankable usually on how to basically manage their public uh, and private finances, right? So disbursement and collection is the first area in which we work. We also, of course, are very much present and very much, uh, I would say, innovative in the urban mobility space. We speak about an example later on, but basically disbursements uh, and uh, payments when you come into the transit uh, system in cities is what we've been traditionally in stronghold in ourselves. And now we're moving into a new era, which is really focused on the power of data. We happen to manage 53 billion transactions a year across the globe, which means we have access to lots of data about how the economy, about tourists work, and we're starting to share this data in a collaborative environment with city governments around the world. So that's in a nutshell what we do. So we tend to leverage on our infrastructure to build value in data analytics and to also enable digital solutions on top of this. And an example of this third level is digital identity. In many parts of Africa, we're now working with the local and national government to use our infrastructure and services to identify uh, eligibility for citizens to be able to get the specific type of benefit. So not only is enabling payments, but also enabling identity, qualification, and the disbursement of the specific service that the government provides. This also means that IoT becomes for us in the city space a foundational element of our strategy. Our vision is to be able to bring commerce into any IoT device. And if you look at what happened in the last five years or seven years with the IoT devices, they became uh, energy efficient, they became context aware, the CPU increased, so they're basically making some computational decisions, but commerce is not there yet. Right? So that's what we're starting to focus on. And we're doing this both through developing our own technologies, making acquisitions, and driving partnerships. And partnership in IoT space for us are aiming to three areas, making the commerce and the payment transaction more convenient, be it with the wearables, or working with companies like GM, who started to bring the payment solution that we have into their suite of services that they bring into the vehicle. It's also about combining our own data and insights with other uh, organizations' data insights to create a much more interactive and contextual payment experience. We're working, for example, here with Zorowski in immersive uh, uh, digital environments to help people understand what they want to buy but also to be able to pay that in a very intuitive way, maybe with their voice. And this is bringing us to the third point, which is about conversational. 
right? So the payment solution in many parts of the world is still quite, uh, in many technologies, still quite uh, clumsy, right? Username, password, authorize, and so on. We want to make it seamless by looking, for example, which we're doing on artificial intelligence and bots that allow me to basically pay me immediately with my voice once I have a conversation taking place on an online platform or face-to-face, -face, uh, and I want to be able to authorize it. So that's a bit how payments uh, and IoT is coming together in the city context for us. Maybe a couple of uh, uh, examples here. In the transit area, we've been working and is now very well known with uh, Transport for London to help them move from a closed loop Oyster Car program that they have, which is quite successful, into an open loop one. So today, travelers, citizens, tourists are able to pay the transit by basically using the contactless cars, just tap it on one of the devices uh, at the station and basically get in. And the idea to me has been very simple. Why do I have to buy a payment card to come into a public transport uh, system and I don't have to do it at the Starbucks or at the restaurant where I can pay my regular card, right? So we basically open up the model and we look at a combination of closed loop and open loop through hybrid cards. So some of the cards and the technology that we are developing are able to basically allow payments around the city but also tap into a closed loop environment and making sure that basically the experience for the citizen is smoothless. And the impact for us has been quite interesting. I mean, we've seen an increase of 40% of trips on the tube when you enable open loop payments. So people are more keen to get into transfer because the barrier to basically buy a ticket is completely lower. You come in, you tap in, and you tap out. We've also seen, which is quite interesting, 30% reduction in the cost of collecting fares for the transport authority. Handling cash or closed loop is much more expensive than basically getting an automated transaction to a certain car or to a mobile phone, if you think about mobile payments, right? So there's uh, efficiency, but there's also a completely different species that we're looking into from a citizen perspective. And that is to us a bit of a starting point because that uh, solution, that card, that mobile uh, payment uh, uh, technology allow us to start thinking about broader services that we can provide into the government and we can basically be with them. Not only transfer, but also these burdens and the likes of it. And also to start looking into how do we use the data coming out of transport systems and other partners that we have to understand, for example, in this case, how tourism works into my city. We announced yesterday a partnership on this program linked to economic development with Dublin, where we're looking at understanding who comes into the city from a tourist perspective, what do they do, when do they book, usually two months before coming to the city, how many websites do they look at, it's 36 websites before I come into a city as an average, and what do they do especially when they're in there? Where do the Germans versus the Italians versus the French spend in Barcelona? And how do I develop a targeted uh, policy to help them understand what the right uh, uh, entertainment or uh, uh, merchants are into the city and be able to launch campaigns to basically direct them into the right situation? Also working, for example, into overflow from over tourism. So if you see this working with us in understanding how to bring them into the city but also bring them around in, in the region. This also means that if you look back at what we do, we are basically helping and collaborating with government in three areas. One is to, beyond the technology, which is, as mentioned before, not the solution, but as the neighbor, we're looking to, first of all, focusing on the people. Not only engaging government, but also engaging the community is a starting point for us. So collapse and the development of initiative at the grassroots level is what we're starting from. Second is orchestrating on control. Government is moving away from procuring technologies from private companies and private sector companies into becoming an innovation orchestrator between the community, the business partners, the startup, academia, and themselves. And their role is going to grow. And the last one, and probably most important, is the continuous reinvention. They're moving away from the smart city projects that we saw here seven, eight years ago. Three years, $20 million investment into agile co-development of solutions in a public-private partnership with the people that allow us to basically move at a much faster speed and to capture the opportunity that smart city is giving us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, very inspiring talk too. So, next speaker is going to be Loic Barr, CEO of Opinum. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I, I want to talk with you about uh, smart cities, obviously, uh, data in smart cities, IoT. And um, as we already mentioned, uh, when we discuss smart cities and uh, IoT, most of the time we saw uh, proof of concept that can uh, 
highlights how the technology can be used to improve um, the daily daily life uh, at the cities. And I think to for uh, joining and 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 deploying this technology outside of a proof of concept, really a full uh, scale deployment on a city, we need to have a uh, really return on investment. Um, uh, and, and really, uh, in, in terms of m money, in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of citizen uh, engagement. And today I want to, to demonstrate a few cases uh, that we have been involved uh, into uh, that show real uh, return on investment and uh, citizen implication. We are, uh, as a company, focused uh, mainly on uh, energy and environmental issue. Uh, it's where we see uh, uh, a good traction and, and, and the easiest uh, return on investment uh, from the, the experience that we have, and we provide um, the, the, uh, the IoT platform to uh, leverage this data. But typically, the problem starts with this image. It's the way we look at smart cities. If you go around here in the Congress and if you look at the booth, you will see that most of the time, uh, smart cities are represented with big buildings, and typically, we see uh, smart cities like uh, big cities. And I think this is um, a mistake uh, that we, we do because there, there is a lot of uh, really mid-size and either uh, small city that can be uh, smart. And, and this is uh, one takeaway I want you to, um, uh, to take from here is really smart doesn't mean big. Uh, smart means uh, bright, intelligent. Uh, and uh, you need to be big to be intelligent. And uh, I want to take um, a, a few uh, cases, uh, case study here, uh, that will show really uh, either mid-sized uh, cities doing things smart, uh, or uh, even really small, tiny cities that uh, involve technology to improve uh, the productivity in the city. Uh, the first case is uh, a Belgium city. Um, it's the city of uh, uh, Louvain-Neuve. Um, it's its own uh, a little bit more than 100 buildings. It's, uh, they do have um, invoice for energy. It's about 1.1 million euro per year. And uh, they decided to uh, invest in uh, IoT technology to uh, improve the energy efficiency uh, within the city. And uh, what they did, typically, they didn't have to invest a lot of uh, money into this project. Uh, the reason is that most of the time, uh, the, 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 the meters, the sensor, they are already there, but they are not connected, and they are uh, not aggregated to uh, make analysis on top of it. And then, typically, what they did, they uh, started to uh, look in the existing building of the city, uh, what was the sensor installed, and they uh, figure out how to collect this information, centralized information, and that uh, provide meaningful insights of, uh, of energy efficiency. Uh, the results are um, astonishing. Uh, there is 25% uh, of electric savings uh, on electricity and 31% uh, on gas. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's, uh, it used to be an invoice of 1.1 million uh, per year, and now uh, with the, the savings, um, uh, they did quite uh, well. And uh, the, the, the good thing about that is that the return on investment is in four months. Not only on the money that they gain uh, with the energy savings, but also uh, the time savings. And you see this is the biggest number on the slide. 80% of the time were saved because they used to do um, energy uh, efficiency reports, but they used to do that uh, manually. And typically, it means that uh, multiple uh, city workers had to uh, go to every building, collect the information, and uh, it was not accurate, it was not uh, granular, and uh, it was difficult to take a uh, uh, good decision about, um, about energy efficiency. Just anecdotes about uh, this case. The, the, the building in the city uh, that consumed the most energy was the Simis 3, which is uh, uh, quite uh, fun. Uh, and the reason is uh, uh, they figure out that uh, the guy that um, managed the sea mystery, he, has, uh, he was quite cold, and uh, he, he, remain, he, he put the, the heater on uh, for all night, like, uh, like that when he entered the building at uh, the morning, it was uh, hot inside. 
And this is how you do savings, but you figure out that this building was uh, actually um, not well managed. Uh, obviously, it's also about water, and this is another project of a really tiny city. We're speaking about two, uh, 2,000 households, and it's really, uh, really, really a small city. Uh, they, uh, they, they used to um, manage the, the water of the household. They, they, they do supply the, um, the water in the city. And uh, you can imagine how inefficient it was to actually collect the information from these 2,000 uh, households. They used to uh, hire students during the summer to go to every home uh, to actually get the, the, the meter readings and invoice uh, uh, the, 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 the citizen based on this information. And there were plenty of issue because there is misreading, there is people that were not there, then they had to do uh, uh, forecast and uh, imagine what would be the consumption of this house. Uh, and uh, it leads to really bad uh, information to the citizen and, and really bad information in, in terms of uh, invoicing. We help them to uh, change uh, the way they work by uh, installing uh, and replacing the, the, the water meter with smart water meter uh, and a drive-by technology, which means that uh, the, the city worker just take his uh, car, go through all the, the street of the city, and this is not a big city, and they, uh, with this information uh, and, and this technology, they can uh, get uh, the, the, the water uh, meter readings automatically uh, in the car, and then this information is transferred uh, to the cloud. Um, obviously, the uh, return on investment here is more on productivity. Uh, they figure out also that there were a lot of people cheating about the, uh, <laughs> the water reading, obviously. Uh, and uh, they can uh, uh, correct that with this technology. And um, they know when to provide this information also to the citizen to help them to uh, decrease the energy consumption, uh, especially here on, uh, on water consumption. Um, I've put uh, for your information uh, the, the slide, and there is a link to videos if uh, you are interested by uh, the, the use case. Um, the, the city representative for the two cases, they, they speak into a video, and I put that on Twitter on the uh, Open Home account. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Oh, good approach. The fact that smart doesn't mean big. That's good. So, well, uh, we will move forward to the last speaker. I think that we are very doing a very good job in terms of timing, which means that we will have some good time for questions. Hope you are moving forward and generating your questions. So now we have uh, Jose Luis Mate, CTO of Public IT Services from NAC. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, I need to apologize. I got a call, so my voice is broken. So I'll, I'll try to do my best. Sorry, sorry for that. So. This picture depicts uh, one of the biggest issues or challenges that cities may, may face in the next coming years, which is basically the deep change in the behavior due to the um, most of the population moving into cities. So in 2050, basically 75% of the population will live in cities. And this is a dramatic change. And on top of that, we have um, many environmental issues, many collaterals that are also affecting the way that cities they have to, to behave. So we have a, because of this increase in population, because of this increase in the number of citizens, we will have constraints in terms of demand for energy, which is going to be multiplied by two. We will have many environmental issues, pollution, uh, greenhouse effect. Demand for food will be also incre increasing, demand for water, everything. So. Although this picture may look like the apocalypse, I don't want to say that. I just want to say that we need to be more efficient. This, this is all. So when we talk about smart, I would say for me smart means efficient. So I think that the first thing we need to do is we need to agree on what smart city is. What is the concept? Because we've seen too many, de too many definitions. So for me, smart city is a new urban concept. So basically, we found the new cities on top of a lot of sensors and data sources. So it's a city based on ICT, information technologies. This city is able to listen and to comprehend. 
is enabled to take decisions and the most important to provide the right decisions, the right information to the people who has to take the decisions in order to do the right things at the, at the right time. And this new city, for sure, this has to be a pleasant place to live, not only to live, but also to work in, efficient you know, for mobility, the way we can commute. This has to be sustainable. This is not just about attracting people, but retaining people for a long time living in the city. And the most important thing, this has to be a safe city. These days, safety and security is becoming more, unfortunately, more and more popular things. So, with these ideas, what, what, what should be the goals of, of this IoT-enabled city? So, basically, we need to be more efficient managing the resources. So, this has to be dynamically allocated in order to use the right resources at the right time to provide the, um, the good service to the citizens. And mobility is going to be a key part of it. So we need to be, uh, we need to improve the way we do the commutation, the, 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 the way the people commute in the city, improving the the eco friendliness of the city. So this has to be free, uh, um, green city, uh, eco friendly city, and citizens. We were talking about citizens a lot, and citizens are a key. They are not just the ones who have to receive the information, but they will also need to provide a lot of information, and probably. Automation. Automation is also a very important, important thing, which is how to provide um, in, an auto, in an autonomous way, in an automatic way, the right actions with the right information to do the right things. Sure. But this is not going to be immediate. So there is a roadmap for this. So we, can, we have the current situation of many cities, which today they are in an early stage in this roadmap. They are somehow inefficient. They are not managing properly, in some cases, all the resources. We can go one step forward, which is we can start building some smart infrastructure. We can invest creating Wi-Fi networks across the city. We can provide some uh, parking services, etc., etc. But if we want to move into the smart phase, we need to have a holistic vision. Holistic vision means we need to break all the silos, and we need to make all the different elements of the city work together as one single city at the end, which is the final goal. And at this phase, we will be able to create the smartest services that will be integrated among them and using a city platform like the core. And when this is available, we will we'll go into the last step, which is the high, what we call the high performance. It means uh, to be digital, this full city digital, as citizens are digital today, which is one of the, of the key issues these days. C citizens are already digital, but the cities are in the process to become digital. So, what is the smart city process? Basically, these are the five steps, mean, meaning we need to be able to re gather the information coming from the different IoT sources and devices. We need to be able to transport into a central location. Then we need to apply all the algorithms and all the intelligence in order to create an analysis and get into the insight. And the most important thing, we need to be able to do this, uh, to transform this into an action. And if we take this into technology, this is how a smart city looks like. With this smart city core platform in the middle, acting like the brain of the city and putting together all the information from the different verticals to provide the insight. And at the end, the, 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 the applications for citizens and the applications for the, for, for the city itself and providing an environment where new entrepreneurs can create a new value for the city as well. But I just want to give you some examples about some services that we are already running based in this technology. So this is for Santander City in Spain, so what we are talking about waste management. So basically we have applied IoT technology in order to control what is the actual level of fullness of the different bins and containers. So we can immediately define what is the best route in order to recover or pick up the, 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 the trash and bring into the into the um, recycling process. So this is not only about sensing all the different elements in the change, but also providing apps for the citizens in order to be able to interact with the system and uh, demand uh, some services when needed. But also for the smart lighting, so how to increase the efficiency, not just changing the bulbs into LED technology, but also using technology like presence detection. So the lights in the street will only be working when there is someone actually walking down the street. So we can furthermore increase 50% more the efficiency of the service. Smart water, how to be able to, using IoT, predict what is going to be the consumption of water 
and on top of that, we can even create new services for citizens, like for example, adult social care. We can detect when a person, an old person, an elder person is, 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 is at home and they are not behaving as their usual profile because they are ill or they are home alone, the system can detect that this, 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 this person needs some attention. But we don't care how efficient are we about water if at the end we waste water because of the leakage. So we are using IoT to detect losses of water because of uh, sound detection. So when there is a leakage of water, there is a sound. So using this technology, we can easily find what is the place where there is this, this leakage. And finally, I'm running out of time, public safety, as I mentioned before. So this is becoming, unfortunately, a very, very popular, popular topic. So we are using IoT, we are using cameras to use face recognition technologies in order to identify the bad guys. So we can use whitelist approach and blacklist approach, so we can use faces to identify uh, terrorism, and we can identify uh, thieves, etc., etc. But this is not only about faces, but also about behavior. So this is about when uh, someone is about to uh, intrude into a house, or there is some robbery, or we want to control traffic behavior. This is not about people looking at the uh, at the at the monitors, but the machines, the the intelligent, uh, the artificial intelligence doing the dirty job for us. I just want to jump into the last slide, which basically, when we talk about this, it looks like this is just in the future, but the future is now. Thank you so much. Okay, good. thank you very much. Okay, good. Well, thank you first to all the, the speakers. So we may have now some questions. Okay, that was for the questions then. Okay, we don't have uh, then that much questions. However, I have a, a few questions to some of the, the speakers here. I mean, basically one of the things that we have been discussing is that uh, this is a challenge, opportunities, but I would like each one of you to shortly say which is the, what is the main barrier you think that is against the IoT introduction into the cities? So we know that there are several, so I would like that each one of you to give one shot on what you think on that. Now, the main challenge. Yeah. So, the main challenge to me is that IoT is still being pursued as a technology conversation, right? It's like we are, and I'm making a stream, from an industry perspective, creating beautiful gadgets. Go to the city government and try to push those gadgets with understanding what exact nature of the issue is at the community and the people level. Right, that's the biggest barrier to entry. That uh, conversation has brought us to what I call the land of pilots, right? So smart city is full of thousands of pilots and very few roll out. And only by bringing together all the parties in a holistic conversation, instead of a siloed point of view, I think we're gonna be able to move beyond pilots and look into real sustainable rollouts that basically serve the community and serve the business purposes of being profitable, being scalable, and the likes of it. But today, we are still, I think, in a siloed phase. Yeah, and, and, and to continue on what you, you say about the silos, um, what we saw, so the, there is a, an issue in interoperability of the system. Let's take an example of two silos, the security and the energy. We've done a project, for example, where we use the security camera, which is normally used to check for safety, but we use the camera to detect the number of people entering a part of a building. And with this information, when we link it to the energy usage of the building, we can know if the building is, for example, cool uh, or, 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 or warm whenever there is nobody in, in this part of the building. And, and really the big issue is to uh, make sure that all this information that are already existing in the city can speak to each other. So I will remark the same point, which is uh, in these projects I was presenting, so one of the biggest barriers is this has to do with the lack of standards. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to replicate the projects. This is not one too many, this is not one thing that we can easily replicate, but in some occasions it's, it's because of the lack of this standardization, uh, it's an issue for the real rollout deployment. Okay, thank you. 
I think uh, for me, the one is, it's around trust. It's trust in, in one's personal data. Um, and I think whilst it's a barrier, I think with leadership and with time, we have to believe that we can overcome it. Um, and that means that we really have to be secure with the data that we store and how we use it. Uh, it's precious. Um, it will open up opportunities if we treat it carefully. So I think it's one of trust and writing the right policies to make sure that we do protect it. Yeah, I think there's really three things that are, are, are barriers. The first is is connected to the trust, but it's also trust between the vendors and the cities that this relationship can be one that is, you know, um, goes beyond the usual procurement methods um, and actually is one that as you're building out this whole system that you're both invested in the ultimate outcomes for the citizens and for the public. And that's a difficult thing for, I think, government to do. There are some great organizations that are nonprofits or um, um, NGOs that are helping to be that platform or place. Our universities are also a great place for that too. The second thing is legacy systems. So everything about the way a city has developed um, has baggage, has legacy to it, right? Whether it's our computer systems, whether it's our transport systems. And so how do we take advantage of IoT and layer that on top of what we already have there? Sometimes fundamentally, just even like with the smart streetlights, we don't have the wires in the ground that can handle that sort of new power demand, right? So there's some legacy systems that, that are a big problem. And then the third is, is the policy framework um, with regards to this. What, how are we going to, um, I think, lay out as, as a, a, a collection of cities around the world the policy framework that we can really deliver this in, in an efficient way um, and, and not fear the fact that technology will be leapfrogging us as we're going, right? We can't you know, wait for the next thing just because it's gonna be replaced in another three or five years. We have to get over the fact that we will consistently be leapfrogged, we will consistently be upgrading, and that's a part of the business that we just have to accept, as opposed to you know things that are lasting half a century, right? We have to kind of change that mindset from a policy perspective as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions from the audience, so I will just throw them on the floor and yourself, you can proceed. So, as the city gets larger, there can be a tendency to deteriorate accessibility to digital services. How do you keep this from happening? So, I mean, we know that you are enlarging the IoT, or enlarging the data. So, do you have any measure, or do you think there is any? There should be any measure to be sure that things does not get into a discontrolled chaos environment. I think it's a great question. I think if we talk about access to digital access to um, the digital world, we have to bring everybody along. So we need to design in accessibility for all, not for some of us, not for a few of us, but for all. So to answer the question, great question, the answer is everyone. Okay, we have another question from the audience. So is it really needed to completely connect? Oops. Okay. Is it really needed to completely connect the city to understand what is happening in the streets? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's very simple. Yes, absolutely it's necessary. And, and it can happen a lot of different ways. It doesn't necessarily always have to be physical infrastructure that we're putting in. Think about all of the insights and analytics that have been discussed just because of the smartphone in your pocket, right? And how that's transforming things. So um, that connectivity is absolutely crucial because we all talked, I think, in ways about rapid urbanization. We have more people jammed into less space, right? And if we aren't connected and we're not using the data to move those services quicker, better, more efficiently, then we're going to blow out our cities. I, I, I totally agree. It, it, it's about making the best out of data exhaust that we have today versus redeploying new infrastructures all the time. I mean, we tend to be using apparently 5% of it that we produce globally. 95% is basically trash. So how do we get smarter? in using this data, carving out the right inside to serve the right purpose at the citizen level without having to redeploy big infrastructures. I mean, there are more than that data to take decisions that we see. And this also comes from combining different data sets owned by different organizations, public, private, large, and small. But the more sets you bring together, the more you're able to carve out insights which are more precise and therefore are more actionable, be it from the government, the citizen, 
or the private sector. Okay, good. So now I will merge one of the questions we get from the audience with a question I also had in mind. The fact is that, that we have seen that we could say that the citizens may become the largest sensor networks in the cities itself. We have then the city full of connectivity uh, devices too. Then my question would be also the fact that does it mean that uh, it could have, we could have an, an in, uh, let's say an artificial intelligence agent which is not only managing the cities, it's also managing the people at some point. And what would be the threats if it might happen that a hacker enters to this? So could it be happen that with the aim to digitalize a city, you are losing the city? Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll kick off on that. Yes, but that exists today, right? And I think cybersecurity is gonna constantly be a problem. We constantly see exposure of records that is going to continue. We have to do the best that we can, and just being afraid of that connectivity because there's gonna be exposure of records, um, I think is, is the wrong perspective. Think about this. The automobile, if, if we knew when it was invented how many people it would kill on a daily basis, would we have ever allowed the car to exist. It's kind of a silly example, but if you just said this technology will kill this many people a day, would we actually use it? It's the same thing as it relates to IoT, data, and the security issues therein. There's so much advantage and opportunity. We have to deal with the cybersecurity threats, but it's not something to say, let's just shut it down and I'll go home. Okay, thank yeah, you. You, you, you can sp think about all the revolution that we have seen. Uh, the, the car is one. Uh, I don't know, plen plenty of other revolution, the phone. Um, and each time it, it comes with three phases. The first phase is uh, the one that provides the, the revolution or exposes the revolution is considered as a fool. That's the first, the first uh, phase uh, for every um, uh, revolution. Think about the car. The first time uh, a guy come with a car, all the other people were, were, uh, were with horses and say, I will never uh, ever uh, drive this thing, uh, I prefer my horses. The second, time, the second phase is, is um, you are not a fool, but uh, uh, you are dangerous. And it happens also with the car, saying, okay, this, 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 this car will kill plenty of people, uh, it's more secure to uh, have a horse. And then the last uh, phase of a revolution is the new normal. And I think we are going through this with IoT. Uh, we are in, in the beginning of this revolution. Uh, we were considered as full. No, it's becoming dangerous. And uh, tomorrow, it will be the new normal. I think uh, David and Loic say it very well, so I'm not going to repeat that. I think the thing I would um, counsel is, is to share these stories, whether it's about the car or some other analogy, is to, to say these things do happen. Our job is to prevent them, not to ignore them, and ignore the opportunity that IoT and a connected system can give us. So we have to keep talking to the stakeholders, each and every one of them. This will help inclusivity for all if we do. Okay, thank you. So let me add one last comment, which is basically, uh, we are talking about how to transform the city into a digital city. And the city is plenty of citizens. And as I said before, citizens are already digital. So they are already in the cloud. They are already trusting in these services. They are already. So probably the gap is between the city and the citizens. It's not the gap in the technology today. OK, thank you very much. So well, we are almost ending the, the session. So just to wrap up, I would like just to give some keynote messages that I have been taking in the notes, which I think that they are important. So it's important to have a convergence between infrastructure, communications, and data. This is clear. We need to build vertical applications using the data and the infrastructure we have underneath. Then it is not a challenge. It's clear that it's an opportunity, and we have to face this. The fact also which is clear is that IoT will shape our day-by-day -day life, and this is uh, true. And this is something that we have to get used to, and we have to accept also. Also, it means that it may change also the, the behavior of the people. I mean, with regards to the mobility they have. Also, if one of the barriers, for example, is using cash, we can easily understand how we may change also how people might behave in the future. The fact also which is important is that smart doesn't mean big, but efficient. And we have been many discussions on how we have to efficiently use all the resources we have between this huge infrastructure. And in the end, what we said is that focus on the people. 
user-centric. So this is key, and we will only succeed if people are the key element of this transformation and digitalization. So thank you very much for your attention, and thank you very much for the speakers again.